Hey everyone, welcome to D20 Woodworking. And today we are reviewing the campaign expansions that are currently available for Marvel Champions, uh, the card game. Now, as I'm making this video, there are four out there. Rise of Red Skull, Galaxy's Most Wanted, Mad Titan Shadow, and Sinister Motives. And I wanted to kind of go through all of them, rank them in order from worst to best, and basically um, break them down by how good I think each scenario or villain is, and how the campaign is as a whole. So... I won't talk too much about the heroes in the boxes, but I'll briefly mention them. Um, but they're not really into the, the the ranking factor at all. So it's just mainly about the villains and the campaign. So let's start with the absolute worst one. I think this really should come to no shock for anyone. And that is Galaxy's Most Wanted. Now here's the thing with Galaxy's. This was one of the uh, you know boxes I was probably the most excited for because I really like the Guardians characters. And it's actually probably the box that's aged the best i would say um and the reason being is because it was so rough around the edges at first now let me explain with the heroes and this really doesn't go to the ranking but with the heroes um a lot of people had issues with rocket when rocket first came out and groot groot was probably the better of the two of them but rocket felt really weak weak and kind of off especially for solo play and as more guardian cards came out rocket got better and i think groot got better too but especially rocket and I think over time, people now see more value in this box, but you do need the other hero packs that came after this with like Star-Lord and Nebula and all that fun stuff. Um, so I think that's one thing that's helped this box over time because the, the heroes were kind of off in the beginning. But let's go through the scenarios because I think some of the changes with the scenarios, or not changes, but I think some of the stuff with the scenarios has improved actually. So for example, Brotherhood of Bad Dune, I think is a fine scenario i think it was always a fine scenario it's probably a little easier than most which is which is good for a first one the villain's fine um and i like i like the expert version of brotherhood bad dune i i think drang was a interesting villain on expert but it's what you expect from a first scenario right the big issue everyone had with this game was scenario to infiltrate the museum, right? This is the whole infamous collection. And this was something that threw a lot of people off. It, it gave a lot of people fits. And I think the reason being is because, especially in the beginning, the vast majority of the heroes had to either attack or thwart or basically be exhausted to do something, to do a lot of stuff. It felt like you had to play that way. And until we started seeing heroes like War Machine, for example, where War Machine doesn't have to ever really exhaust and can still do a ton of damage on a ton of thwarting with how his you know system is built out. With heroes like War Machine, you can now exhaust War Machine to focus in on, um, on the collection, right? So because of being able to focus on the collection of War Machine, just I'm using him as an example, right? That makes this scenario easier and not as difficult as it was when it first came out right rocket and grew it felt like you had to exhaust all the time to to do anything with that and this made this scenario really really difficult off the bat so i actually think over time infiltrate the museum has actually gotten better now it's still really really hard for certain heroes but there are now heroes that are out there that this is an easier scenario the other issue with this box is they had the same enemy or the same villain twice essentially right escape from the museum yes it's a different way of playing the game but you're still going against the collector and it feels like cheap it, feel, it feels kind of weird like why why was the collector so special with this like and i get with the story kind of makes a bit more sense but i still feel like they could have done this better as far as the scenario goes it, it's a fine scenario it's one i don't play a lot because i actually think it's kind of easy where you just run a, a strong justice deck and you can crush the scenario very quickly right because it's just how fast can you scheme or how fast can you thwart sorry so, so that makes this scenario pretty easy in the campaign version it's a little more difficult obviously because now you have to balance it out um you know over several different rounds and whatnot but um or several different uh scenarios but it's still not this like incredibly hard scenario three it's probably one of the weakest one in all the boxes i would say so it's just i don't know it feels off and again it feels kind of cheap that we had the same villain twice in a row even though it was a very different scenario next up was nebula and Nebula, I really liked, then I really hated, then I kind of liked, then I didn't like. And my swinginess with Nebula is a direct result of how swingy she is. This villain could be the easiest villain in the game or the hardest, right? Just straight up because of how her deck works and how it's it can be a, a, a cascading avalanche of bad. Um, this can go from really good to really bad. But the problem is you could even be playing really well, but it doesn't matter. If she gets the right draw, you're just kind of done. And that 
kind of stinks. I'm not going to lie. Um, it's it just there's not a lot of consistency to her, and you feel like you're just playing a random game that doesn't matter what you do. It just kind of depends on what she does, which I don't know. It, it kind of puts a sour mood on, on a lot of her scenarios and her games. Um, so I like her when it's a balanced draw she gets where she doesn't feel too overpowered or anything like that. But when she gets the right draw and just absolutely crushes you, it kind of it kind of stinks. I'm not going to lie. So the last one is the most famous one from this box. And this scenario alone probably brings this this whole box down. And that's Rodin. They, they screwed up so bad on Rodin. And I don't understand how this wasn't fixed in playtesting. The thing with Rodin is I don't mind the idea of, of a scale from one to 10 in difficulty that a villain starts at an 11, right? Like I don't even, I don't even hate that idea. I kind of like it. And I kind of wish this is what they, this is what they did with Ronin, right? He starts at like an 11 difficulty, right? With how much he gets set up, which is fine, right? It's fine. The way to balance that out though, is you have to make the rest of his deck, right? And the rest of him and how he works a bit easier, right? Like a seven, maybe an eight difficulty on expert. So that this way, yes, okay, in the front, the first few rounds, man, it's really, really hard. And it's really, really difficult. But I know if I just like I outlast him, I have a chance of winning. The problem is they went to a 12 difficulty, right? He, he gets even harder as his cards come out. And it just makes him not fun. And that's not even including the campaign version of him on Expert, which is stupidly hard. I don't, I will never understand to this day how they looked at that and said, yes, this is a, a possible thing for people to be on solo, especially maybe on, maybe on four player multiplayer it is, but I just, I, I do not understand some of the choices that were made there. And you can tell that they realize they messed up because they've come back and said, Oh wait, some of this stuff is optional. You know, you don't have to do the campaign in a certain way, right? Like they've come back and they've had to fix it because it was just such a giant miss with Ronan. And I, I will say this in their defense. I know a lot of people were complaining about rise of red skull being too easy. And I'm sure they said, okay, Let's make it difficult, right? You you, you said it's too easy, so we're going to make it the exact opposite of that. Um, so part of that is on the community for, you know, basically just kind of ripping Rise of Red Skull. It's too easy. I didn't ever think it was too easy. Yes, it was easier, and it should be because it's the first uh, campaign box. Um, but people are really ripping on that, which is which also didn't really help the situation when the community does that. Now, here's the one really, really, really good thing about this box, though, and I still think it's one of the best things, is the, the market, right, where you got... Uh, unit points at the end of each round hopefully and you could buy cards from the market i thought this was the best system of the uh, campaign cards of any of them and this is one of the things that i actually will still come back to galaxy's most wanted and just not really play ronin or play a modified version of him uh, well I'll, I'll try him on his original way they meant to play him and then when i lose enough i'll try something else but uh this is one of those things that keeps getting me back into the game is this campaign market um, you know, deck of cards. Like, I think it's really cool to buy different upgrades or events or whatever else and have them be used for the rest of your campaign. I, I really like this system. I wish they would implement it more. They're, they're doing something different with each box, it seems. But if they ever went back to doing something, I hope it's this. So Galaxy's Most Wanted was my least favorite. Now, number two on this list is Sinister Motives, our most recent box. The reason being is straight up, because of the reputation track. I am not a fan of this track. I like that they tried something new and different. You know, I'm not upset about that whatsoever, but I don't like the track. And the reason being is because as you move up the reputation track, not only do good things happen, but bad things happen. And I never felt like the good things really outweighed the bad things, or at best they were kind of like equal. So it never felt like I was getting this huge benefit. It felt like every time I got a decent benefit, I was getting a decent loss as well. And I just, I don't know. It, it just made going up the reputation track not as fun. Um, it was a lot of bookkeeping, which felt weird. And that's not a bad thing. It just felt weird for a Marvel Champions game. So there's a lot of things I just, I didn't really care for with that reputation track. Um, and I will say this about the heroes, that the heroes themselves I think were by far the strongest heroes in the box. So if you ever looking to buy a box for just the heroes, this is probably the one that you want to get um, because the heroes are very strong in this box. And I know that that turned a lot of people off too. That was um, that they were just a little too powerful for this box. Um, that makes a lot of the scenarios pretty easy. Um, but anyway, I, th I think the heroes are good. I think they're getting better as more cards come out. So yeah, there's that. 
All right, so going through the scenarios themselves, I like a lot of the villains in here. And I think they're pretty unique. Um, but I, I didn't fall like in love with any of them. So first off is Sandman. I thought it was fine, right? I like how Sandman works with doing indirect damage. I think it's a pretty cool way of doing things. I think it's different. I, I like it. For a first scenario, I think Sandman was really, really good. For a second scenario, Venom, I thought he was fine, right? I don't love Venom, but I thought he was fine. Uh, the campaign cards kind of make it a bit more difficult, which is nice in, in this in this uh, campaign scenario. But Venom himself isn't that hard, and Ghost Spider can really crush him really easily, which is the way that Ghost Spider works, which I think is funny. Um, but yeah, so Venom is is fine, but not overly difficult. And I kind of wanted a bit more from Venom, I guess. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I just I, I have a weird taste in my mouth with Venom. Next up was Mysterio, which I know a lot of people have challenge uh, challenges with because when he adds a ton of his cards into your deck, it could be really bad. Things you just do a rush strategy in Mysterio, and Mysterio is pretty easy. Um, there's very few times I have, you know, that much difficulty, I guess, for for Mysterio. Um, but yeah, I think I think he's fine. Expert, he's a bit harder, but I don't think he's overly hard. I think for a scenario three, he's he's kind of on the weak side, which is fine. But yeah, I'm not a I'm not a huge Mysterio fan. Sinister Six, I think is. One of the most fascinating scenarios that are out there because I like the whole idea of, you know, the villains like popping in and out and like it's a benefit to take them out. But sometimes you don't want like I like it. I, I really like Sinister Six. I like how it works. I like how, you know, you're trying to escape this whole tunnel thing. I think it's fun. I think the campaign version is a good difficulty. Right. And I think they try to balance it well with having Venom be the ally. I, I think that's all well done. And I really enjoyed this scenario. And then it all kind of falls apart with Venom Goblin. <laughs> um, Venom Goblin, Goblin is tough. I think it's fair to say on X or on standard, he's very hard and expert. I haven't beaten him yet. On the campaign version, he's pretty hard. And there's just a lot going on. I think he's now the hardest boss out there. I think he's even tougher than Ronin, which just because you can get a bad card draw and it just ruins everything. And there's a lot to do and you have to be very well balanced. But I do think over time, Venom Goblin will be the better villain compared to Ronin, right? Like I, Ronin, I always felt cheated out of wins. Like I never felt like I ever um, earned a loss, right? Like I, it wasn't poor play. It was just bad card draw. Venom, it feels like when I lose... A lot of the times it's because I played poorly and I like to lose that way. And with Venom Gobl Goblin, it feels like that. Like, I feel like after I lose, it's like, okay, maybe there's some things I could have done better. Let's focus on those things and let's see how we do. Versus Ronin, it was just, I, I lost because I got the wrong, wrong card draw and he stacked way too much in the beginning, right? That That's all it was. So um, I think over time, Venom Goblin will be a better villain over time. And I think that will improve this box. But as of right now, that's kind of where I rank it, um, you know, second from the bottom, mainly because of this reputation track. I really don't like it. I like the idea of them taking, you know, taking risks and trying something different. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't love it, especially with the, the shield tech upgrades that you get. It's like, you can't even pick one. It's randomized and there's a chance you can put it to its upgrade side, which it helps you, but not like a ton. Like, it, I don't know. It, 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 I don't like the market cards the market cards in this in this scenario either so those are kind of my biggest strikes against this box all right next up is number three which is the mad titan shadow right this is i think the second best box out there right now and the weakest part of this box for me is i'm not a big fan of either hero in this box like adam warlock is a very good hero he's very very strong um, but the Wild Tutor deck seems to be the best version of him and it's kind of why do you build him any other way and spectrum is I like the idea. I just don't think she works that well. So the heroes are kind of weak, but even not accounting those in there, right? And if I did put heroes in boxes, Sinister and Mad Titans might actually be flipped the other way. They're, they're very, very close in toss-up. Um, but with Mad Titan Shadow, I don't know how much over time I've liked the mechanism of the side schemes get you upgrades. So it feels like I'm focusing on truly something else that's kind of not really related to the what i'm at what i'm dealing with at hand right so a lot of these side schemes are added in the beginning for mad titan shadow while i'm focusing on the villain 
oh wait, I also have to do these things. And it feels like I'm, my attention is being pulled two different ways, which I guess is thematic in a sense, right? You know, the hero's dilemma, what do you focus on? But after playing it a few times, like you know which ones are the good ones that you want to go after and you know the other ones, uh, you don't really have to worry about them, right? So I don't know. I just, I don't think I like the campaign as much as I, the campaign cards as much as I did in the very beginning. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I just, I think uh I think it's gotten worse with time for me. Um so that's that's been kind of the, the biggest negative, I guess, and again what brings it down. So as far as scenarios go, I think going through the scenarios, the scenarios are pretty good overall. I really I really generally enjoy them and I enjoy the campaign versions of them. So first up was Ebony Mall, which I think is a fantastic uh first like scenario villain to fight against. I like the whole spell thing and how that works. I think that's fun. Um, and campaign version of Ebony Mall, I think is the same amount of difficulty, right? You get like the extra cards out there with what is the secure the landing pad and, and security breach. And this is what I mean by the campaign difficulty doesn't feel much different than the actual box difficulty, which isn't bad, but I want there to be some differences. I, I don't know. It, it's a weird feeling that, yes, I understand that there are differences, but it just it doesn't feel like enough, and it feels kind of like I'm just playing all the villains in a certain order, right? That there's not necessarily much with the campaign going on. But, as far as the first scenario, I think Ebony Maul is really, really good. The second scenario, Tower Defense, I really enjoy. I like the two different villains out there, and I like the whole which one's active, and you know, the flipping of the tower when there's too much damage on it, there's two main schemes. Like, I, I like all that. I think that's really, really good. I think an expert's a really good challenge. Um, overall, um, you know, I like that you can add the modular difficulty of what putting damage on the tower to, to start off with. I think that's all fun. Again, the campaign difficulty doesn't feel much different than the actual game itself difficulty. Uh, but I think for a second scenario, I think it's absolutely perfect. So next up is Thanos, which Thanos is what starts taking this box to the next level, right? Thanos is a scenario five boss, but just put in scenario three because of how his mechanics work. He is extremely difficult. The Infinity Gauntlet encounter set is extremely difficult and I love it. I love it, love it, love it. Because when I lose the Thanos, I feel like there's things I could have done better to win the game. And the biggest thing is just keeping that threat down so that you don't have to go through a snap, right? And lose half your deck. That's the worst part of the game, um, but it's very thematic. It's very, very awesome. The theme of this box, I think, is really well done. And Thanos is really, really well done. The campaign setup, um, you know, is a bit more involved, right? There's a, bu uh, there's a few more things going on depending on how previous things played out. And to me, that's where this starts getting interesting with the campaign is in the campaign setup. Um, the game changes a bit, right? Not a ton, but a bit. Now, what changes a lot is the next scenario, which is uh, scenario four, which is Hella. Because if you went through a snap, right, from the, the, the previous one, you have to discard the top half of your deck, which is really kind of thematic for Hella. I think it's really interesting. And Hella I, is my favorite encounter in this entire game, right? I love Hella. I think the way they did it, we're kind of traversing through things and fighting certain things and size. I, I love all of it. And this scenario alone brings this box up a whole nother level for me. I love this scenario. I think the campaign version of the scenario in the grand scheme is really, really cool. I think it's well done. My biggest gripe with this box is the fifth villain, which is Loki. Loki doesn't really have like an expert version, right? You just have to defeat more Lokis, which feels kind of weird i guess i don't know i'm not a big fan of that um loki himself is very very difficult right loki is a very difficult villain to start off with and what's frustrating with loki is they decide after they made this difficult villain they said oh wait you know we have this really cool infinity gauntlet deck we haven't used it for a while let's just throw it in with loki and make him really hard Right, without that deck, Loki is still tough, but he's a manageable tough, right? Like it feels like you can defeat him and you can do well against him. With that deck of cards, it, it kind of almost feels cheap. I don't know. It just, it just doesn't feel right. And it doesn't, in the comic little section, I guess it kind of makes sense. But like in the MCU, it doesn't make like a ton of sense. So I don't know. It, it just, it feels off. It feels weird. And I don't know. Loki should have either been a bit easier and the deck made him harder or... Loki should have been the same difficulty as maybe a little bit harder, but no um, Infinity Gauntlet deck. So anyway, 
Overall, I really enjoyed that box. Obviously, I think Hela and Thanos lift that box up a lot. I think the first two scenarios are really well done. Just Loki drags it a bit down. And I, as time has gone on, I'm not the biggest fan of the campaign cards in that box. So obviously, the last one is Rise of Red Skull. Now, here's the thing. While I think this is the best one, I think it's going to keep getting worse because it's starting to age um, and not be great. Now, the heroes in there with, with uh, Spider-Woman and Hawkeye, I think they're great heroes. Spider-Woman especially is, is super strong and interesting. But the campaign itself, I think, is really starting to show its its age with the tech upgrades and the basic conditions, right? And then the, the upgrade or improved conditions after that. And the reason being is because the, you just finish the scenario and you get the upgrade, right? You just finish the scenario, you get the condition. You just finish the scenario, you get, you know, the improved version of it, right? Besides Taskmaster, there isn't much difference in what goes on through a campaign. So it's just, you're kind of going through the motions, which just feels, it feels dated at this point. But as far as the villains are, the villains are really, really good. Scenario one, Crossbones is still an enjoyable villain. I love to play Crossbones. I think he's, he's a good, difficult first scenario. As far as like the campaign setup goes, um, you know, there, there, there really is none. <laughs> so there's that. Um, but next up is Absorbing Man, which is one of the biggest misses of all villains. He's so incredibly easy, easy even on Expert. It kind of drags this whole scenario down a bit or this whole campaign down a bit because you have basically a scenario where you can reset and like really focus on healing back up and getting better. Um, and... Expert side of him isn't really that much more difficult, right? He's just, he's kind of a miss as a villain as a whole. We come back to Taskmaster, who I really enjoy Taskmaster. I think Taskmaster is a lot of fun. I like the whole, you're trying to free the different allies um, that are captured by him. This is the one part of the, the scenario that can change because you can get like four, you know, allies. Or you can get no allies, right? It, it's kind of random in that sense and how much you work toward it. But I like Taskmaster as an encounter. I think Taskmaster is really good. Scenario four, Zola is final boss material, right? Zola is final villain material. He's very difficult. He has aged exceptionally well. He's still a lot of fun to play. An expert version of him is still really, really challenging, even with all the cards that are currently out there. And I really like Zola. I think Zola is really good. Um, and I think he's he kind of carries this box and makes it really, really fascinating and good. Individually, I like playing him in the campaign. He's still one of the things I think about the most, right? I think about Zola the most when I go through this campaign, and that's what I'm gearing my deck up to beat. Because after that's Red Skull, which is interesting, right? Like, I like the whole side scheme deck thing. The problem is once you kind of figure out Red Skull, it's done. Red Skull, you just have to worry about the side schemes. And then once the sleeper comes out, deal with that. And once the sleeper is gone, don't have to worry, right? This game becomes a lot easier because the campaign cards that you were given have all pretty much upgraded at this point, and they're pretty strong, right? They're pretty strong. So Red Skull doesn't feel like the campaign makes it much more difficult. Uh, maybe a little bit with, um, you know, how many delay counters, I guess, were in the beginning, and then you could put them on the main scheme or whatever, and then you can shuffle experimental weapons, which makes them a little more difficult. Not a ton though, right? It's not overly difficult, but I still like him. I still like his design. I still feel like him and Zola should have been swapped as far as difficulty of like Zola should have been the final bad boss, but thematically it doesn't make sense. So I get why they did it, but whatever. Anyway, Red Skull, I think is fine, but it's showing its age because it's pretty easy to defeat him now, even though Zola's kind of the harder one on this. So anyway, Rise of Red Skull, still my number one campaign box as far as you know campaign and villains mixed together um but i don't see it staying up there i actually think mad titan shadow will continue to climb the ranks as loki either gets easier because the cards keep getting stronger uh because hella is so incredibly thematic and fun i even see sinister motives moving up right galaxies uh, it's probably gonna stay in there for a while but anyway that is my list that is my ranking do me a huge favor if you watched this video and you made this point probably enjoy my content or at least you know like it somewhat so make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already we're trying to hit a thousand subscribers so it mean a lot if you hit that button while you're down there hit the like button and leave a comment what do you think of my list and what is your list right of the four boxes that are currently out how would you rank them out of enjoyment just focusing on the villain side right not the hero side but just on the villain side and the campaign side how would you rank the boxes i'm interested to hear your thoughts and thank you for watching this video